Hey, Mike from Prep Pros here. I got a perfect score on the March 2023 SAT. So I'm gonna do explanations for every single part of the test. We're gonna start with no calc here before moving to calc and then the other section. So make sure to subscribe, like this video so it gets out there. As I work through this section, I'm gonna talk about how I'm looking at the questions and how I'm breaking it down, but also how I teach students that I work with to look at the questions. So this will hopefully help you improve a lot before you take your next SAT. Now, SAT goes from easy to hard in the math sections, and then it restarts again with that trend in the pre-response. But here, all we simply have to do is subtract over the 10, we get our correct answer of negative seven. You should be moving quick through those first questions here. Now, word problems always can feel a little tricky for a lot of students. If you struggle with these, reading them more than once is absolutely okay, and try to pull out a main idea sentence by sentence. Jacqueline spent $150 for supplies and gas to start a lawn mowing service. She charges $25 for each lawn she mows. In the first week, Jacqueline made $50 after the cost of supplies and gas was deducted. Which equation represents this situation where X is the number of lawns Jacqueline mowed during the first week? Well, if I'm pulling out main ideas from each sentence, I know in this first one, she was down $150. This was her initial spend, so she's starting negative. Now, for every additional lawn she mows, she's gonna make 25X. And what we know is after the first week, she's $50 positive. So if we put this in math terms, we could say, well, 25X, this is gonna be 25 times the number of lawns that she mowed, minus 150 minus that initial cost is gonna be equal to 50. That's why A is our correct answer. Now, if you ever get turned around on questions like this, you could actually solve for X and then plug that back into each answer choice to see which one ends up working out. That's one way, if you don't feel comfortable looking at this and finding the right answer, you still can go through and work through a more standard way and then use that X value to find the correct answer at the end. All right, number three, system of equations. Now, since these are both in Y equals form, it would be the same if they were X equals form, I can just set the pieces of the equation equal to each other. So we're gonna get 18X plus 25 equals negative 14X minus seven. Now I just wanna move my X terms to one side and my numbers to another. So we'll get 32X equals negative 32. That gives me that X equals negative one. Now I always want to, that is a very messy circle there, X equals negative one. I always wanna look at the answer choices because I don't wanna do any more work on the SAT than I have to. Well, only one of these gives me X is negative one. So I can tell that B is right and I can move on. You can save more time by cutting corners. You wanna do so on questions where you can already spot the right answer. The given equation relates the positive numbers a, b, x, and y. Which equation correctly expresses a in terms of b, x, and y? Well, if these ever confuse you in terms of how it's kind of expressed, just look at the answer choices. It's just asking you to isolate for a. So first thing we can do here is we can add over the y. We'll get ax equals bxy plus y. And well now, since we're isolating for A, we're multiplying it by X. So let's just divide X by both sides. And at this point, we can see that A is matching up perfectly to our answer. So we can spot that A is correct and move on. Now, number five here, the function H models the height H of T in meters T seconds after it's kicked. What is the interpretation of H of two equals 0 0.4? Well, this is a function interpretation question here. So what we wanna first start about is the easiest part. We know this is saying it two seconds. So any answer choice that does not say two seconds, I can eliminate. So that gets me to C anyways. But what we're really saying is when we plug two in for T in this function, we're gonna get an output of 0 0.4. So that's gonna tell us at two seconds, it has a height of 0 0.4 meters and that's how we can see that C is correct a few different ways. Number 15, so this is a classic, this is kind of a favorite thing for absolute value from the SAT, is they love to make you get rid of the absolute value bars. Now, whenever we're doing this, we're gonna have to set the right side equal to the positive and negative, but before we do that, we wanna move everything over the right side. So we're gonna get the absolute value of 15 minus X equals nine. Now we can get rid of those absolute value bars by setting it equal to positive nine and setting it equal to negative nine. Well, up here, we're gonna get negative X equals negative six. That's gonna give us that X equals six. 
And down here, we're going to get negative x equals negative 24. That's going to give us that x equals 24. That's how we can see that d is our correct answer there. All right, on to seven. I'm going to have to zoom in on this one based off my screenshots here. Um, Lucy and John will work together to make 60 paper flowers for a school party. The line shown represents the possible combination of time and hours spent by Lucia and John to fulfill this task. According to the graph on average, how many paper flowers will Lucia make per hour? Well, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more for you guys here. So this is the time that Lucia is spending. And so what we can see here, let me get rid of that so it's a little bit easier for you guys to follow, is when John is spending zero hours, Lucia is spending 12 hours. And so we always want to use intercepts for questions like this because it's far easier. Because what we could really just say here is we could say 12L equals 60, and that's going to let us see that L equals 5. That's the number of flowers that Lucy is making per hour. That's how we can see that B is correct. Every single time I've seen this question type on the SAT, you can take advantage of the intercepts to solve rather than trying to create a fancy system of equations using points in the middle of the line. All right, number eight here. So the graph of y equals f of x minus one is shown which equation could define function f. So this is actually something I, I believe I predicted pretty nicely to tons of my students. And I think in my video that you'll see on the test, we've got tons of graphing questions. Now this one is just shifting stuff. So this is the graph of y equals f of x minus one. So if I'm looking for the graph of y equals f of x, I need to take all of these points on the graph and I need to shift them up one. So with these, I pretty much always just have to pick two points. Instead of the point zero comma two, now we have the point zero comma three. And instead of our original point one comma three, we now have the point one comma four. So what I know is if I plug zero in, I better get three out. So I'd start by plugging the zero in for all of these. Well, two to the zero equals one, doesn't equal three. Two to the zero equals one, one minus one equals zero, that doesn't equal three. Two to the zero equals one, one plus one equals two, not gonna work. We don't even have to check a second point here, but in D, I'll do all the little steps here. Two to the zero plus two is gonna go to one plus two, and that does equal three. So when we plug in zero, we get three out. Always pick two points just to be safe, but if you can solve for it on the first one, you're good to move forward. All right, looks like I put a fancy border in for this question here. Um, I don't know how I did that. In the xy plane, the graph of the given equation is a circle. The circle is inscribed in a square. What is the perimeter of the square? Now, this is actually a pretty tricky question to be number nine. This is testing us on completing the square, and we're also gonna have to visualize this correctly. Now, when we're completing the square, the standard form of a circle is x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. And I definitely predict this was going to be on the test. Um, now, when we're doing this, there's a series of steps we have to follow through. And I'm going to pop those up on the screen so you can follow through those steps um, from my book here. Um, but first thing I have to do is I have to kick the numbers over to the right side. So I'm going to do x squared minus 10x plus y squared minus 6y equals 47. Now I have to group my x and y terms and I leave a little bit of space. So I'm gonna get x squared minus 10x, I'm gonna leave a little bit of room, plus y squared minus 6y, leave a little bit of room, equals 47. And now we complete the square. To complete the square, you always take your middle term, your middle coefficient, divide by two and square it. Negative 10 over two is negative five, Negative 5 squared is 25. So we add it here, and we're going to add it to this part, which is going to affect the radius, which is what we're worried about for this question. Negative 6 over 2 is negative 3. Negative 3 squared is 9. So we're going to add 9 to both of these pieces. Now we just have to add this all together. So 47 plus 25 plus 9, that is going to give us 81. So since that is r squared, that now tells us that our radius is going to be 9. Now, I'm going to get rid of all of this so we can draw this out. Quite a few students, I'm sure, incorrectly picked 36 here, but let's go ahead and draw out a square. Doesn't have to be great. I'm no fantastic artist. We'll see if I can use notability here to make a nice looking circle, though. 
All right, now if a circle is inscribed in a square, we're gonna imagine that this circle is just touching all of the sides of the square. So this is what the figure really should kind of look like. It's just gonna be touching that. Now from the circle, we know going all the way up and all the way down is gonna be the diameter of the circle, which is gonna be twice the radius. So that means going all of this distance is gonna be 18. And that tells us that the height of the square is gonna be 18. Since the square, all sides are the same, that means all of these are gonna be 18. So our answer is simply gonna be four by 18. This was a pretty tricky question to show up at number nine. We're using a few specific skills of completing the square and correctly visualizing this. Anytime you get a problem like this, make sure you draw a figure or they're super, super easy to make a small mistake on. I definitely drew a figure on test day for that. All right, exponents. So fractional exponents, another thing that I predicted, the SAT has been hammering away at these in the last year. So I definitely anticipate you're taking the SAT in May or April or even this last fall, you're gonna wanna make sure you're comfortable with these. Now, what we wanna be able to do here is we typically can re-express these in fractional form is the easiest. So the fifth root is the same as the one fifth power. So for many students, the easiest way of approaching these is working through this way. So now what we have to think about is we're multiplying the one fifth power to each of those powers and we have to make sure we don't forget that we also have to take the fifth root of 32, which is gonna equal two. So at this point, we can get rid of C, we can get rid of D. So we know we're gonna have two because that's the fifth root of 32. Well, now this is gonna be the same as A to the three times one fifth and B to the fourth times one fifth and that's gonna give us 2a to the 3 fifths, b to the 4 fifths, and that's gonna give us our correct answer there of a. Being able to go from this root form to this fractional exponent form is a really important skill and pattern that shows up constantly on the SAT. Now, this was a bit of a tricky one, definitely kind of a good visualization question, so hopefully this is zoomed in enough that everybody can follow along. A hemisphere and a cone, so we're putting two shapes together have circular bases of equal circumference and have been connected at their bases as shown in the figure. The diameter of the base of the hemisphere is six centimeters and the total height of the figure is nine centimeters. What is the volume in centimeters cubed of the cone in the hemisphere? Well, I'm actually, I'm so used to just seeing the formula of the SAT that I'm gonna have to pull up the formula really quickly to make sure I'm not gonna make a mistake here um, because I know for a fact on test day, I did look back at the formula for these shapes here. So just so I don't make any silly mistakes here, I'm gonna go back and look at those. Um, all right, cool. So a whole spheres formula is, that's why I was pretty sure they were. Whole spheres formula is V equals four thirds pi r cubed. When the SAT constantly gives you these things, you don't have to worry about memorizing them. And a cone is gonna be one thirds pi r squared h. Now. The visualization of this part and what we have to think about is the hemisphere is half of a sphere. So what we know is they have circular bases of equal circumference and are connected at the bases. The diameter of the base of the hemisphere is six centimeters. So that means the radius is three and the height of the figure is nine. Now this is the tricky part here. So since the height of the figure is nine and we're taking half of a hemisphere, that means that this part is gonna be three up here. And that means the height of the, um, of the cone here is gonna only be six. So now we can go through and solve. Well, to solve for our first part of the shape, which I'll color in as blue up here, we're gonna use this formula, but we're gonna to have to divide it by two because we're only solving for half of a sphere. So now we're gonna do that V equals four thirds pi times three cubed, I wanted to make sure, yeah, that's the correct part I'm looking at, times three cubed, and then I'm gonna have to divide this all by two. Well, three cubed is 27, 27 times four thirds is gonna give me 36, 36 divided by two is gonna give me 18. So I'm gonna have 18 pi from the first part up here. Now our bottom part is gonna be relatively straightforward. Since they have the same diameter, they are also gonna have the exact same radius. So that means now our, for our cone formula, all we're simply gonna be doing is V equals one third 
pi r squared, and so this is going to be one third times three squared. And then we know our height is six from what we saw for earlier. Now three squared is nine, one third of nine is three pi. Three pi times six is going to give us once again, they funnily enough have the exact same volume. Now we simply have to add these two 18 pi's together. And that's going to give us our correct answer there of 36 pi. Definitely a tricky question. All right, number 12. This was a borderline perfect straight repeat from any old SAT test. Um, this was number 15 on a calculator section. I'll pop that up on the screen here so you can kind of see how consistent and how many patterns we see over and over on the SAT. And that's how I'm able to rock it through these sections and just know exactly what to do when I get to the questions is I've just seen these patterns and I'm so familiar with the test. Now this is testing on a common SAT mistake that tons of people make. This is not just the same as a squared over four squared plus b squared over three squared. You have to foil this and that's the part that students consistently love to kind of mess up on these questions is they forget that when we're dealing with these, we have to foil them. So as long as we go back through and we write them out like this, it's gonna be way easier for us to get this right. Now we just have to do the same first outers, inners, last, which you're probably pretty comfortable with. So we'll start with our firsts. So we're gonna get a squared over 16. We're done with that first part. Now we'll do our outers. So we're gonna end up with a, B over 12, and when we do our inners again, we're going to get that exact same thing. We're going to get a plus A, B over 12, and then when we do our lasts, we're going to get plus B squared over 9. Now we just have to combine like terms. This is no different than A squared over 16 plus 2AB over 12 plus b squared over nine. But we don't see any answers that are matching up to this, but we can cancel out the two up here and the 12 down there, and we can simplify it down to ab over six. Now you could plug in values for a question like this, but if I was gonna do that, I'd make that a equals four and b equals three or b equals six and a equals eight to make my life easy on these. And you can play a matching game, but this is not a super hard skill to get down. So I'd prefer most students to solve it the more technical way here. I'm down for cheating the test as well as you can, but that one's gonna take you a lot more time. All right, so another thing I predicted that we were gonna see on the test, SAT loves one, no infinite solutions. Now for one solution, what we have to conceptually understand that we're looking for is we need to see a different slope but we do not care about the intercepts. They could be the same, they could be different. Don't care about that. All we need is the slopes to be different. So a really fast way I could look, about, look at this is the ratio of x to y in each of these equations, whichever one is different, is gonna be my correct answer. And that's how I can look at this in 10 seconds and tell that c is correct. The ratio of my x coefficient to y coefficient in c is different than the ratio of two over negative two in this initial expression. Now, the safer way you can do this, if you don't feel as comfortable doing it that kind of advanced way, is simply put them into y equals mx plus b form. So we'll get negative 2y equals negative 2x plus 2. Then we'll get that y equals x. And this other part isn't going to matter, x minus 1. But whichever one doesn't also have a positive slope of x when we solve through, that's going to give us our right answer. And that's what we can see with C here is if we sub add over that 10x, we're going to get 8y equals 10x plus 5. Then we'll get that y equals 10 over 8, which we could reduce down to 5 over 4, x plus uh, 5 over 8, right? This part doesn't matter, but this gives us a different slope. That's how we can see that C is our correct answer. Every other one is going to give us that exact same slope of positive 1 when they're in y equals mx plus b form. So I hope that really helps. That's the few ways you can approach those questions in the future. Now, this was the kind of killer question on the SAT. This is the first time I've actually seen them test on vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Now, you still absolutely could work your way to the correct answer here, 
by plugging in points on the graph and just seeing which one works. So if you look at this and you're like, Ooh, I don't know my asymptote rules, you could still start plugging in points. Like you could plug in the point negative 10 for X. And what we can see is only one of those answers is in the negative. So that would be the first thing that I would do here. So if I plug in negative 10, and we'll go through doing it this cheating way before we go through the more technical rules. If I go through and I plug in negative 10 and I get a negative output, that's gonna tell me that, well, this has to be the correct answer here. Um, so negative four times negative 10, 40 plus 16. So that's gonna give us 56 over, this will be negative eight, right? That is definitely gonna be negative. So that's one way I could pick points and find my correct answer. Now, the technical rules for asymptotes are actually not super difficult. To solve for your vertical asymptote, you simply set your denominator equal to zero. So we do x plus two equals zero, and we get that x equals negative two. Now that's gonna tell us there's gonna be this imaginary kind of vertical line sitting here that the line is never gonna be able to cross. So once we see that it's negative two, we could eliminate B. Now for our horizontal asymptote, since the highest power is the same in the numerator and the denominator, we simply are gonna divide out the leading coefficients. So this is gonna be the same as negative four over one, which equals negative four. So now this tells me that I need to have a horizontal asymptote. So that's gonna be a horizontal line that they never quite cross. I drew that pretty poorly there at negative four. So only D is gonna give us that correct position. And that's how we can see that D must be the correct answer. Two different ways we could approach this technical and non-technical to find the right answer. You always wanna get as comfortable as possible with strategy so you can solve these as easy as possible. This is another one I predicted. This is basically a free question on the test. Super easy to miss, but if you watch my prediction video, hopefully you knew that, well, the y-intercept of the graph, we always find our y-intercept when x equals zero. So let's simply plug in zero here. Anything to the zero is one. So we're gonna get one plus three. That's gonna tell us that we're gonna have the point zero comma four is our y-intercept. It's question 15, but it's pretty easy as long as we know that little trick. All right, oh, this one's a little longer. Uh, the function m is defined by m of x. This is no different than f of x or y equals um, 30x plus 120. What is the slope of the graph of y equals m of x is just saying, what is the slope of this um, in the xy plane? Well, this is gonna be our m value. So the slope is simply gonna be 30. Our y intercept is gonna be 120. All right, 17, the function f is defined by f of x equals 1 fifths x plus 9 tenths. For what value of x does f of x equal 1? Now, we need to be really careful with how we are solving these. When it says for what value of x, we're setting this whole expression equal to 1. We're going to solve for x. So we're going to do 1 equals 1 fifth x plus 9 over 10. So we're going to still have to subtract over 9 over 10. So we can re-express this is 10 over 10, that's the same as one. Now we're gonna subtract over that nine tenths. So we're gonna get one tenth equals one fifth x. Now you can always do these a bunch of different ways. If fractions aren't your thing, cross multiplying is usually what feels most comfortable for most students. So we're gonna end up with five equals 10 x. And now when we solve for x, we're simply gonna divide by 10 and that gives us that x equals five over 10, or x equals 0 0.5 or one half. Either one is acceptable. All right, 18 here. This was a pretty kind of tricky question. But once again, another thing I predicted, the SAT loves these line questions. This was a little bit of a twist, but as long as we're comfortable with our kind of basics of lines, we can work through this. Line K in the XY plane has slope of negative two P over five and Y intercept of zero comma P, where P is a positive constant. What is the X coordinate, right? And we're stacking another subject we already talked about finding intercepts of the X intercept of the line of K. So let's write this out. This is gonna give us the equation Y equals negative two P over five. So we'll have negative two P over five times X plus p because our y intercept is zero comma p. Well now, once again, 
Hopefully you all watched my prediction video and you got to this and you knew that if we're solving for the x coordinate of the x-intercept, well, we simply have to plug in zero for y. So we get that y equals negative two p over five x plus p. Now let's subtract over that p. So we're gonna get that negative p equals, oh, sorry, plug in zero for, yeah. Negative p equals negative two fifths my brain is not following with my pen here, two fifths, two p over five times x, and now we simply have to solve for x. So we can always go ahead and cross multiply here. So we could get negative five p equals negative two p x, and now we could simply just divide out by that negative two p, and that's gonna give us that five over two is going to equal x. And that's gonna give us our correct answer of five halves or 2.5. My brain was not following with my pen there for a minute. All right, on to 19. When I got to this question, I immediately knew where the SAT had already used this. So basically before I was even halfway through the question, I was smashing down a zero on my Scantron sheet. This is identical to a question from SAT test eight. It's the exact same concept. This is the SAT's favorite trig identity, um, which deals with complementary angles. And that's sine of x equals cosine of 90 minus x or cosine of x equals sine of 90 minus x. And that's just saying that they're the exact same. So since the two angles are the exact same, that's gonna tell us, sorry, that our cosine of x and our sine of y, which is the same as 90 minus x, that's gonna tell us since they're the same, if you subtract one from another, it's gonna equal zero. But we'll break this down a little bit more. In triangle DEF, point G not shown lies on DE. If the measure of DFG is X. DFG, oh, I think they, oh, got it. DF, all right, point G not shown. I was having a moment there. DFG is X um, and the measure of GFE is Y. What is the value of cosine of X minus sine of Y? So DFG, so this angle measure here um, is X and the measure of GFE, so I'll label this here, GFE is Y, what is the value of cosine of X minus sine of Y? As I said, this is just a trig identity you really had to have memorized. Um, and all we know is if we have complementary angles where they add up to 90 degrees, the cosine of one is always equal to the sine of the other. And so that's how we can just automatically tell that zero is our correct answer. For many students, this is just a pure memorization thing to be able to get this question right. But this is the trig identity and I'll pop it up on the screen here um, that you do have to have memorized because the SAT loves to ask about it. All right, on to question 20. This was another one that hopefully if you watched my prediction video, you got here and you were just going straight to negative B over A to find the answer. You weren't trying to factor it. You weren't trying to use the quadratic formula. The SAT loves sum of solution questions and they're free points. Well, this is our A value, this is our B value. We don't need to worry about our C value. So we're gonna have negative, negative two over three. That's gonna give us the same as two over three. And that's gonna give us our correct answer there. So really hope this video helped you out a lot. As I said, I'm gonna be working through the other sections of the SAT. I will also have a diagnostic sheet up for this test really soon on my um, website. If you're looking for some free math help, I strongly recommend checking out my free trial. Go over questions and formulas and rules exactly like this that would have helped you out on test day. If you're looking for a full ultimate SAT course, you should definitely sign up for that. If you have any questions at all, drop them in the comments.